Hey songwriters, welcome back to At Home Songwriting. This is another live recording of one of our workshops, and this is all about writing verses. This was recorded on Saturday, October 8th, 2022. And this is where we dive into what is the job of your verse, and what are some tips that you can use in your own songwriting to improve your verses. If you would like to join us live for future workshops, be sure to join our meetup.com group at home songwriting workshops. There's a link in the description, so we hope to see you there. And if you have any questions, put them in the comments. I'll be sure to read those. So let's check it out. And want to say hi to Paul and Steven and Autumn and Ra. Who else we got? Leslie, Adam's here, Susan. Um, for those of you who just joined, we were talking about uh, last weekend, I decided that I was going to um, write, write and record 10 songs in 30 days. So I started on October 2nd. So I want to write and record 10 songs by November 2nd and then put the the songs out online in the middle of November. Um, and we so we started kind of talking about like, what is that, you know, that process and things like that. So I'm three and a half songs in this first week. So I'm actually kind of ahead of schedule. Um, but um, I was talking about how possibly in January, we as a group could maybe do a write 10 songs in January group type of a thing where, um, you know, starting January 1st or the first week in January, we can go over some tips on how you might think, of, or maybe in December even, start before the month and talk about tips on how you would approach and sort of um, break down the process of of writing that many songs in a month. Because I think that's more songs than, um, you know, I, I usually write maybe a song a week. So writing 10 songs in a month is a faster pace than I'm, than I normally do. Um, but it's a fun accountability exercise that sort of makes you think a little bit more creatively. And it also makes you not worry so much about every little decision that you're making in your songs because you are on a deadline and you're kind of, kind of moving forward. So, um, Adam says he's going to a farm outside of Nashville next week where 24 songwriters wait, write 24 songs in 24 hours. And not necessarily together. <laughs> So are you, so does that mean you yourself are writing a song an hour? Yeah, I could. I, I could collaborate too. It works any which way. The host, uh, this is the second annual one. The host is the only one who wrote 24 songs last year. Um, I don't know. I don't think any of them were collaborations though for him. So, have yeah, have you done it, but you've done it before. I didn't get to go last year. No, uh. I'm not invited for this year. Yeah, I'll, I'll write 24 songs. I don't know that they'll be good, <laughs> but I'll, I'll write them. I don't know what kind of prep I'm going to do for it, though. I'm kind of on the fence. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of winging it entirely or at least partially winging it and kind of treating it like a journal, you know, just yeah. whatever really comes to mind. Let it let it happen. Um, well, I think if if you start from nothing right if you start at zero you don't have anything prepped you don't have anything even if you don't hit 24 songs you're going to have more songs than you started with right and you're going to have that yeah. experience that helps you you know yeah but for the first time i actually feel like competitive with my friend uh, when he told me <laughs> that, when he told me he's the only one who completed 24 last year i was like well i guess i gotta write 24 now I'm going to yeah. go listen to his 24 or I'll be listening to his 24 on the way down. We're driving down. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, definitely report back to us on how that goes. Cause that's, oh, I will. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure this group would love to hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Well, welcome everybody. I see some new faces here as well. So, um, this is at home songwriting. I'm Chad Shank. I started at home songwriting as a YouTube channel. Um, actually like exactly a year ago, I think, October 8th was when I actually started posting videos or somewhere around the time and then started the meetup group as well. So a lot of you I've gotten to know, which is awesome. Today we're talking about writing verses and really talking about both structure of verses and also content of verses. And as I was preparing this, I kept throwing more and more stuff in because I thought there's so much stuff. So hopefully we can keep it somewhat in time and, and, um, have a good time doing this as well. So um, if you haven't already, please go to athomesongwriting.com and um, follow the YouTube channel. It helps other songwriters um, 
see the the videos that we put out and these workshops do get posted so if you you know miss taking notes or something like that um you can rewatch the videos i do have to cut out any of the pro songs that we use um just because we can't use the copyright but um definitely check out the the page and and follow and let me just explain too if you would like to ask questions you can use your re uh, function down on the bottom of your screen um, it's under reactions you can use the raise hand function um, or you can also put questions in the chat as we go along as well i'll definitely try to um, follow along in the chat as much as i can too so today the goal of going over verses is to really give you structure and content ideas and some tools to help you write your best song so none of this is meant to tell you this is how you should be writing your songs it's more like these are things that work so how can you implement them into your own writing so the the takeaway for you today is take these things that you learn and the things that you think about and try to think about them in your next writing sessions because these tools really only help you when you actually practice them and Adam, maybe you can use some of these ideas, you know, when you're writing 24 songs in 24 hours. So first off, let's talk about common song sections and the roles that they play. So all of us know that most songs or yeah, a lot of songs, most songs have verses. So there's two types of song section. One is a development section or a setup section. And then the other is the basically the uh, central idea or the emotional center of the song. So your verses are development sections. So their job is to set up the situation and establish who, when, and where, and what is going on. So your verse is really your first opportunity to int introduce what the song is, is going to explore to your listener. So the first verse plays a really important setup and development role your chorus then is the central idea of the song and it's where the emotion of the song or the main idea lives this really establishes the why you said all of the stuff in the verse so it, it's your verses who when where what your chorus is that emotional why and then the bridge is an opportunity to go somewhere new so the bridge takes us further into the topic and it expands on the overall idea. So as you think about verses, it really gives context and it establishes the context for your chorus. And it also is a chance to introduce us to the characters. That's the who. It puts us in the setting, which is the where. And then it also establishes a place in time, which is the when. And usually you need at least two of the three to really have your song kind of make sense to your listener. So you need, you know, out of the three things, who, when, and where, you need two of those. Sometimes you may not know exactly where a song is happening, but you get a sense of a place in time and who it's happening to. Verses also usually will have a little bit more physical language. It has a little bit more imagery. It's a little bit more concrete than it is abstract. Your verses also help you to establish rhythmic and melodic motif within the song as well. So your verse is the first time that your listener is hearing any sort of pattern within the music. And the thing about patterns, and as we talk about contrast, is once you have something established, you can then make the decision, do I repeat that or do I do something different? And that's where that element of sometimes surprising your listener comes in so you can use what's happening in the verse to really then give them an extra surprise once you get to the chorus verses also can change the meaning of your chorus and it can make your chorus mean more as the song goes on and for those of you who have read pat patterson's books or watched his videos he talks about writing songs in three boxes and each box gets a little bit bigger and gains emotional weight through the verses as it, it changes and recolors what the chorus is saying. And I'll be showing you some examples of, of that coming up. So 
don't have to think too deeply about that uh, at this moment. So again, just to review your verses set up and give context and really establish why the chorus matters. So that's kind of something that you'll hear over and over again today. So what about verse content? So these are tips on how you can sort of start to think about and develop your verses. So I kind of made a grid. And like I said, you're really thinking about who, where, when, and what. And you can think about it as, you know, who is doing something, who is something happening to, or and who is feeling it? Where are they doing it? Where is it happening? Where are they feeling it? All the same. So you kind of have all these questions that you can start to ask as you're thinking about writing a song. So let's say you come up with a title. A lot of people start with a title. These are questions that you can start to ask. So let's say your title is, you know, Lost in Walmart, right? Like that's just your title, Lost in Walmart. We already sort of know where it's happening, right? Because we're the title itself is already telling us we're in Walmart. But when is this happening? Or when is somebody getting lost? You know, we have the what too, they're lost, but we don't know who or when, right? So as you're thinking about writing, ask these questions about whatever nugget of information or whatever idea you're starting with and, and think about just, and at this point, you're not writing actual lyrics. You're really just starting to outline and map out where you could go with the song. So I do this a lot where it's like, okay, what, what do I want to write about? And when I say what, it's like, what sort of emotion am I writing about? What situation am I writing about? And then ask these questions, who, where, when, what's going on? And verses tend to start with more imagery details, more physical words, more concrete details, and then they wrap up with emotions that surround the concrete parts. And one way to think about this is you establish the setting and then you explain to your listener why they should care is basically a good way to think about it. So it's you set it up and then you say why all of this matters. So if we look at uh, a song by Miley Cyrus, this song was written by um, Andrew Watt and Ali Tamposi, who have written a lot of current um, hit songs. If you look at the yellow lines, it starts off more concrete and then it goes a little bit more emotional to explain kind of what's happening. And, it, and this verse is broken into basically two sections that do two lines of concrete, two lines of more emotional. And this is a, a thing that you can do in your writing as well. So it goes, midnight and the moon is out. Careful, you might hurt yourself. Pleasure leads to pain. To me, they're both the same. So the first two lines are very image-based. You can experience it through your senses. And then the last lines are a little bit more internal. They're talking about pleasure, which is something that you don't necessarily see or hear. And then the second line or the second half is sweat dripping down to the floor, bite marks like an animal. You might be insane, but maybe we're the same. So again, it's more concrete and then more emotional. So it's setting that scene and then giving us a little bit more of that emotion. So let's listen also to how the melodic motif follows these lines as well. You'll see that these two lines have a similar motif, and then these two lines have a similar motif, and that pattern repeats as well. So this is give me what I want. So that next section where it went into the same tonight, that was like a pre-chorus before it led into that chorus. But do you see how that verse really established where we are and sort of who it's happening to. So the when in this situation is it's midnight and the moon is out. So that's setting a time and kind of a place. Who is the singer talking to you? Cause it's saying careful, you might hurt yourself. Um, and then talking also about themselves as the singer. Um, the, the where is like, apparently you're, you're outside, right? So it's not directly saying 
that they're outside but obviously the moon is out um you know actually they might be inside too sweat dripping down to the floor bite marks like an animal so it may be setting a scene inside too so sometimes the who when and the where are not directly said it's more of like an implication of of where it's happening so any questions on that thought process of the kind of that concrete emotional language I'll show some other examples of this um, as well. Oh, Adam. Yeah, I just wanted to note, this is a really unique rhyme scheme. So <clears throat> clearly lines three and four and seven and eight are rhymes. I mean, they're imperfect rhymes, but they're very, very close. Ending, you know, yep. same vowel and N or M. But lines one and two and five and six are not, don't rhyme at all but the vowels are close enough that they don't kind of draw attention to themselves as being out of place especially the way she delivered it you know like I, as i was listening i'm like like I, I, i'm like those those words don't rhyme but they sound close enough so i, I yeah, just think yeah. it's very a very very unique rhyme scheme <laughs> Yeah, so I would consider this XXAA, XXAA. So it's two lines that don't really rhyme and then two lines that rhyme. And this, the the N and the M, that would be a family rhyme because they're in the they're in the same consonant family with the same vowel. Um, and we're going to do a whole workshop on rhymes next Tuesday. So if you want to um, check that out, we'll definitely um, talk more about that. But what you're hearing, Adam, I think the lines, they may not rhyme lyrically, but what's happening is they're rhyming melodically. So if you listen again, the melody is the same, and it it gives you that that sense of rhyme, but it's more of a, a musical rhyme. So let's listen again to that. So that's a really good observation. She says animal and floor, they almost sound like the same vowel. She is kind of saying animal. Yeah. 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 It's like if you did something like I don't there, I mean, there's definitely like a phonetic. There's something going on here that like I don't I don't understand. I mean, I, I, we can identify it by ear. I mean, I can identify it by ear, but I, I don't know what to call it. But like if she went midnight and the moon is out, careful, you might hurt your ooh, like like just some vowel that would really draw attention to itself. It's almost like um, yeah, it's almost like they're there. And of course, the melody that you pointed out is clearly the most important glue anyway I just but no really but, but that but it's yeah. a great point on rhyme though it's not about how words are read it's about how words are sung and a lot of times words when they're sung they're not pronounced the same as when you just read them especially if you are singing you know it depends on the singer right different singers pronounce um words differently there's this new um Oh, there's this new sort of like newish singer like accent thing that I can't even like imitate where they like they sing like self as like self or like self or they like tonight like they add different they sing it differently um and Susan is, is yeah schwa, this is key what, what Susan pointed out is schwa the word is I've never heard that before what is schwa Oh, uh, right? I'll say I'll say a schwa in in English in American English anyway. Uh, it's it's the sound of any unaccented syllable. So it might be spelled with an a and o, a u, an e, i, whatever. Um, but the way we say it, if it's not accented, is a sort of like uh sound. And so that's what your yourself. But she sort of unaccentized. <laughs> the the word so that it turned it into a schwa so like yourself actually if i say yourself i'm accenting self right let's see oh, let's see but it's your is the part that's rhyming with out basically when she said that midnight and the moon is out careful you might hurt yourself so did you hear the uh sound in your and the sound in out so i mean anyway the way that fits with the way we could write you know in rhyming things ourselves is is not necessarily looking at the actual what's called orthography or the way it's spelled yep. the word the letters that are chosen because in english that isn't necessarily the sound we make 
So we also have to be making sure that we're not just looking at the words. <laughs> so but see if that no, rhymes. We it, say I them. mean that's that's the I mean that's a hundred percent the point. It's it's all yeah. about how it's sung. Um, because in songwriting, we're not writing poetry, whereas like poetry would change that in some ways, because the way that you might recite something is not the same as the way you sing it. So because yeah. I think sometimes people will be like, those two words don't rhyme. But when you listen to how they're sung, that's when there's actually that. Um, and what a rhyme basically is, is a matching of sounds, right? So it's 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 a matching sound or met matching like phonetically so awesome susan i learned something from you today that's great <laughs> well that's great i had to spend a whole semester in a phon <laughs> phonetics class taking transcriptions of sounds from all different languages including english so i it's worthless almost most of the time knowing all of that <laughs> i'm super glad to have used it now you things. now you have a use for it that's awesome thanks <laughs> um so one of the things that most verses when you're talking about um, songs within the last probably 50 years, um, any songs that are kind of either commercial or relatively commercial or within more of like, a, I would say a singer songwriter genre, most of verses are conversational, which means they're usually using everyday language. Um, and it's really like you would be talking to one of your friends and the emotion within writing. And I think this is where some people get a little bit mixed up when they're writing is they try to write very flowery and descriptive and try to create emotion through those, those words. But the emotion actually comes from your listener understanding the situation and putting themselves into the the shoes of either the singer or like the characters so it's not about like am i going to say these magical words that just make someone feel my song it's more about are you setting it up correctly to explain and show the emotion so some of you are are familiar with jason isbell who jason isbell is an incredible songwriter and he has a song called elephant and the first part of the first verse it says, she said, Andy, you're better than your past, winked at me and drained her glass, cross-legged on a bar stool like nobody sits anymore. That's very simple, everyday language that on its own, it's not really telling us any emotion, right? He's just um, showing us what somebody's saying, what she's doing. Um, but think about this when you're stuck in trying to write something very poetic. This song is not poetic. It's just kind of, it's as if he's just telling us a story, right? So again, it's, she said, Andy, you're better than your past. Winked at me and drained her glass. Cross-legged on a bar stool like nobody sits anymore. So right here in those three lines, we've already established a who and a where, right? So the who is she, and then assuming Andy is the singer or someone who is by the singer, and then says winked at me and drained her glass. And then it says cross-legged on a bar stool, which basically sets up where this is happening. It's probably in a bar, right? So there's an example of the song itself establishing a who and a where in very conversational language that doesn't sound written. You know, I think a lot of times when you hear newer songwriters, the songs sound like nursery rhymes and it sounds very sort of trite or sort of written in that respect. So what I wanted to do is play the song Elephant for you and then also talk about uh, more observations that I have within this lyric, but this is a very good example of using image words to create emotion. And also this song has pretty strong structure and uses repetition really well as well. So this is um, Elephant by Jason Isbell. Such a powerful song. Um, any observations that you all had from from listening to that i can see by people's faces that that kind of hit some of you in the feels a little bit um i've heard that song a ton of times and um yeah 
I, it still gets me every time. And the thing is, is it never comes out and just says anything. It shows us what's going on. So we actually feel it like it's a movie in our mind, I think, which is really the goal that we want to do for our listeners. Um, whoops. If I can go to the next thing. So one of the things that I noticed within the song is that we've talked a lot about this like so but therefore concept where you set um you know we set up the the so here's the situation but and then here's the therefore so here's what goes forward so if you looked at this song from the beginning you know the first part is really setting up the so so she said so she said andy you're better than your past winked at me and drained her glass cross-legged on a bar stool like nobody sits anymore. She said, Andy, you're taking me home, but I knew she planned to sleep alone. I'd carry her to bed and sweep up the hair from her floor. That's the first time we get a sense of something is like different, right? And the taking me home implied kind of where they're at in the time of, of night. Um, and it says, if I'd, you know, her before she got sick, I'd never hear the end of it. She don't have the spirit for that now. So that's kind of the but part of it. And then the therefore is, since she's in that situation, we just drink our drinks and laugh out loud and we bitch about the weekend crowd, which means that they go to the bar, right? And try to ignore the elephant somehow. When he sings the, that that title the first time, I think is when it gets me, it starts to get it starts to get me in that feeling place because it's like we know what's happening now because of the images that were set up. And the the elephant is basically that she's dying. And the song never says that in this section, right? So Ra says is the elephant like referred to as the problem. Um, I would say that from a, the, the conflict of the whole song is that she's sick. So I think the elephant is like the elephant is the elephant in the room that nobody's talking about her dying, but she is right. Like it's, they're trying to, you know, they're burning joints and like they're doing all these things to to reflect on what was, but they're not really talking about what is, I think is is the idea of the song. And Jason Isbell says that this is like the best, he considers this one of the best songs that he's ever written, um, which I can see why. When you go to then the second verse after the establishment, there's again this so, but, therefore so the 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 situation is she said and you crack me up seagram's in a coffee cup sharecropper eyes and her hair almost all gone when she was drunk she made cancer jokes made up her doctor's notes but surrounded by family i saw that she was dying alone so this is the very first time that they actually use the word dying and then it gets to therefore I'd sing her classic country songs and she'd get high and sing along, but she don't have much voice to sing with now. So there's so much going on in this section that they're looking back, but they're also in the current spot where she, she's starting to lose her voice. So it's like in the beginning of this process, she was in a better spot than she is now. And we're getting all this in very few lyrics, which I think is why these types of songs are so powerful. So it's, this is a song that you should take on your own and just listen to it and see like what's happening because I think the music that happens below each section also is adding to the emotion as well because you hear a lot of tension and release within what's happening musically there's a lot of dynamics from quiet to um like the the louder parts uh so rod the the color so the first orange color is setting up the situation so that's the so the yellow is the but and then the pink is the therefore so we've talked about that um talked about that in past workshops um a as well so if you go back and, and watch that so it's basically setting up a situation a conflict and then a resolution 
it's kind of a, a storytelling uh, tool. So wanted to show you a video that I found that I've watched a few times just to really inspire and remind myself. So the, the song that we listened to by Miley Cyrus um, was written by Ali Tamposi and Andrew Watt, who are um, currently they're writing a lot of songs for a lot of big artists. They've had a lot of different hits. They've won Grammys. Um, this video really shows you, I just love this short video because it shows you not only their process, but it also reaffirms that this who, when, where thing is something that pro songwriters actually think about. So um, this is from a, a series that Spotify actually does um, called Song Start. And this is Ali Tamposi and Andrew Watts. Um, and we'll come back after this. Susan says, great. Adam? I like how they um, seem to put on equal footing the um, the instrumental hook with the melodic and the lyrical hook. I tend to not think that way. So I'm, ha I'm always excited when I hear people like that who I admire their work already saying something like that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Forces yeah. me out of my comfort zone, my, my comfortable beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I think that's a mistake that all of us make, right? Is we focus on one element over another and um, really like we, we sort of get really good at one part of, of the song, right? And then the other stuff we just kind of rush through where they're basically saying like, you've got these three things that you need to have all working together to really make it, you know, the best song possible. Um, Razzie says he loves how they vibe together with songwriting and makes it more simple. Um, absolutely. And I think that's the key with some of these things that we talk about is like, we never want to discount inspiration and when things just sort of come out of nowhere and, and we have these great ideas, but the key is to really know how do you then develop the ideas that are coming to you? So that's where knowing structure, knowing what your options are, um, can really help. Um, so J Rock says he'd like to find out more about the AABA format um, and what what he said about that. So basically, what that is is you establish a melodic motif, you repeat it, and the lyric. So your your first line and lyrics are establish the that motif. The second line has the same melody, but a different but different lyrics. And then the third line has different lyrics and different melodies. So it's giving us something completely different. And then it comes back to the same melody with different lyrics. So it's it's melodic motif, repeat it. That's your second A. And then it's do something different. And then the last A is come back to it. So it's um, So it's basically do it, repeat it, change it, do it again, kind of is what the AABA um, is, um, Susan says they found their yin to their yang. Absolutely. Uh, Ra says, uh, a great teamwork is the key to collaboration, any work project. And I feel like music sometimes singers and producers are in different head spaces and that makes it challenging to come up with something beautiful. I think that's the key. I think for when you are thinking about co-writing is you really need to find people that you do just get that that synergy with and that's not easy to find right so it's a lot like i think dating um to try to find those those teams that work you'll find a lot of times in in cities like nashville people write with a lot of different people but they end up coming back to the ones that feel the best right so it's all about how do you find the ones that the the magic kind of happens uh, Leslie says, love the grabbing ideas from the air, reminds her of a book that she's reading, Big Magic. Yeah, we talked about um, that last time as well. So Elizabeth Gilbert, doesn't she talk about genius, where the concept of genius is that genius is a, um, like a, uh, like an entity or like a spirit, and you're, you're, or the muse, maybe it's the muse, maybe it's not genius, but the muse sort of comes in and you have to either like work with it or not, which is, I think, a cool concept. Um, so J-Rock says, how does it fit with, so does, how does AABA fit with verse chorus? So songs 
can really be broken down um, sort of micro and macro, right? So not only in your verse could you have AABA, but you could have um, AABA as a song form as well, which is what happens a lot of times in your uh, verse refrain songs. So the first A would be verse refrain. The second A would be verse refrain, which would be the same melodically. And then your B section would be the bridge, and then you'd come back to another verse. So it's all about kind of you establish a, a motif, you do it again just to repeat it so people know it, and then you do something different, and then you come back to it. So not only can you do that within a verse, you can do that with song sections as well. So let's talk about some hit song verses and see if you can spot the who, when, the where, and the what. So this is you guys kind of discussing um, with with the group and kind of sharing your your thoughts and ideas here. Um, you know, kind of what what you are what you're experiencing, and this is how you can practice some of this stuff with the songs that that you like is really breaking it down to what's actually happening structurally within the song. So verses commercially usually tend to have four or six lines. Um, you know, there's other songs that break the rules. I know there's always somebody that says, well, what about this song? It has like 18,000 lines in the verse. It's fine. But normally you're looking at four to six lines usually within a section because that usually matches up to about eight uh, measures or eight bars or so. So the song Easy On Me that was performed by Adele, I'll read the lyrics and then put in the chat or raise your hand as we talk about like the who, the when, and the where, and the what. So the lyrics go, there ain't no gold in this river that I've been washing my hands in forever. I know there is no hope in these waters, but I can't bring myself to swim when I'm drowning in silence. Baby, let me in. So that's the verse. What is the, what is the, or who is the who? How is it establishing a who? I think it's somebody who is like going through something that I've been washing my hands in forever. Uh, and like somebody who's always, always like hoping or something, who's in pain and is describing that she's like crying in pain and she's suffering. Yeah, so basically saying the, the singer would be one who for sure. Uh, Jay. So, I mean, uh, it, it seems to me as though they're explaining the situation uh, loosely, but at the end where it says baby let me in i feel as though that's a that's an inference to someone where she has an emotional connection and so while she's explaining the situation it's to someone who she's endeared yeah so basically what you're saying jay is the the first who is we understand that the singer is singing in first person as steven said in the chat but at the end of the verse she says baby let me in so that that implies that she's singing to her partner which is basically what you're you're saying jay so, uh, so what where where is this happening any thoughts on i mean she says like i'm enjoying this silence and this waters it's all very like abstract things there's no way to know where like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think with this particular song, I don't think we really know where it's happening. I know it starts off saying in this river, but we kind of know that Adele isn't actually in a river, right? Like it's it's a metaphor for what's going on. Um, so again, a lot of times you will have um, kind of a, a, you know, two of the three. So we have a who the where is kind of ambiguous, as Stephen says. Um, you know, it does still put us into a picture, though, because it talks about river, 
washing hands. So we do see a place, even though the song isn't literally happening in the place. It's it, that metaphor is establishing a picture for us in our minds. So this verse, again, follows concrete details first and then emotion later, right? So it talks about a river, washing hands, water, swimming, and then drowning in silence. That is where the emotional piece comes in. So it's it's images, setting, emotion. So it follows what we've already talked about. Um, the when is basically like kind of like in present tense, right? But it's referring to what she's been doing. So it's present tense, but referring back to what has happened in the past. Um, so it's an interest, there's a lot happening just within a few like lyrical lines, right? So that's, that's what you should try to shoot for in your own writing is to have some depth and have an efficiency of, of line and words that, that you can say a lot like that. And that's where thinking about the, how am I establishing my who, how am I establishing a where, how am I establishing a timeline within this? And once you have that established in your first verse, you don't have to keep telling us the same thing um, all the time. It's, and Pat Patterson would say that details run down your song. So once you have the, the sort of the, the picture painted, you don't have to keep repainting it. Your listener will subconsciously know where everything is still happening as the song progresses. From a, a rhyme scheme perspective, it's interesting that this uses what we would call consonant rhyme. So river, forever, waters, the er sound is rhyming, which is that's the furthest and most unstable rhyme type is a consonant rhyme. So that unstable rhyme gives us a little bit of a subconscious sense of structure, but yet it feels a little bit dissonance or dissonant. So it's river, forever, waters, swim, silence. So the I sound, that's kind of a rhyme with swim and silence and then in. So it's an A, 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 B, B, B rhyme scheme. But, but if you notice, there's no perfect rhymes. If they would have used perfect rhymes, those rhymes probably would have stood out more than the content. And that's where that concept of prosody comes in. So if, if she's struggling and can't bring her, her, you know, herself to swim and like, it's very unstable, all of those rhymes fit that it's unstable. So that's a great use of, of prosody. Uh, Susan says nasal consonants for M and N for the last three lines for sure. Yeah. All of these lines end in a consonant rather than a vowel, which is interesting. So it, it has a very abrupt like ending. So each line, the way it's sung, ends abruptly. And, and the thing is, is did Adele think about this as she's writing it? Maybe. But the key is not about the intention of the writer. It's how the song is delivering the emotion in application, right? So these are concepts that you can think about on purpose until you start to do it by instinct. Another song, um, taking it back to the 80s a little bit, is Time After Time uh, by Cyndi Lauper. So again, how are how is she establishing who, when, where, and what's going on? So the lyrics go, lying in my bed, I hear the clock tick and think of you, Caught up in circles, confusion is nothing new. Flashback, warm nights, almost left behind. Suitcase of memories, time after time, basically. But it leaves you hanging on the end. So who is the who, or what is the who in this, this verse? Singer. What was that? A singer. Yep, yep. And why would you, why would you say that? Because she's not referring as anybody else, but in my bed, I hear. And when you say, when you see it in the lyrics, the I or the me, we always 
think that they should be referred to the singer. Absolutely. Is there another who in this section too as well? You. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you. <laughs> so yeah, so we have the first person again singing to someone else. So that's the direct, that's what you would call a direct address. So even though it's saying you as if she's singing to the listener, we sort of as the listener know that she's not actually talking to us. She's talking about another person, right? I think that's the way we we take direct addresses. We assume that they're talking to another person and we're just an observer of the song. So where is this happening? In space, in a timeline. <laughs> there's no physical i mean in my bed in a room but the way how she describes circles confusions no thing you she's describing like her situation uh like where she's at yeah so the, the where this section actually starts um this section actually starts off stating where so it's it's in her bed right that's that's where it's happening is directly it's in the bed and then what is happening is kind of the, you know, hearing the clock tick, caught up in circles, flashing back to warm nights. So the when then is present tense, right? We're in present tense, but she's reflecting back and having that flashback that, you know, a suitcase of memories, right? So it's establishing the who, we have the singer and a person she's singing to where is in bed and then when is sort of like present tense but looking back right so again all three of those things when where and who are covered in that first verse and i think what's what's interesting about these different songs and different genres is almost always that information is is what is given to the listener to set the song up to make sense for the rest of the song the next song we're going to talk about is Bad Habits by Ed Sheeran. Um, Ed Sheeran is also a pretty talented songwriter. Um, so we'll do the same, same exercise on this one. So the lyrics go, every time you come around, you know I can't say no. Every time the sun goes down, I let you take control. I can feel the paradise before my world implodes. And tonight had something wonderful. What is the who in this song? Or who is the the who? Yeah. Uh, the who is you? Is the talking this the singer talking about his lover? Right. So it's there. It's the I and you again. So again, it's a direct address song where it's the singer talking to someone. We don't necessarily know that they're a lover, right? It's just every time you come around, you know, I can't say no. Every time the sun goes down, I let you take control. Um, I can feel the paradise before my world implodes and tonight had something wonderful. This song, I actually think, I think he's singing to drugs. Actually, if you listen to the rest of the song, I think he's actually singing about addiction and he's singing to drugs, but he's singing to something or somebody else right when is this happening when the sun goes down yeah. every <laughs> time every time he does it or whatever yeah <laughs> this is on a constant basis oh okay 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 got it got it <laughs> I, agree with, I agree with susan daily because it's it kind of, i mean not daily but like every time it's, it's like a occasional thing that happens right so there's no like a not fine and that's a specific time and day but it, it always happens so occasionally yeah i think when. i think i think the situation is happening daily but the actual time frame is established in the last line where it says tonight oh, so cool. it's 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 referring to other times, but it's it's present tense. Yeah. Um, and then where, we don't know where this is happening, right? This could be, this could be anywhere. It's not really, it's not really 
establishing a where, but it has the two of the three. What's also interesting about this song um, is the rhyme scheme on the end too. So this comes back to our schwa that we were talking about before, I think, where it says no, control, implode, wonderful. The way he sings wonderful isn't full, he's saying wonderful. So it's no control implodes wonderful. That is a, a, a near rhyme. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's kind of an A A, it's an A A A A rhyme scheme, and then Adam said this song is actually um, an A A B A melody. So going back to what we were talking about before, um, it because it has the the first two lines establish a melody that every time you come around, you know I can't say no. Every time the sun goes down, I let you take control. I can feel the paradise before my world implodes. And tonight, and then it changes on the end, but basically it is A-A-B-A. And that was a oh, bad rendition. It does change again at the end, does it? <laughs> it does. Is it to yeah. Okay, but so. it still gives you the A-A. I mean, it establishes the, the yeah. If you repeat something three times, you're playing with fire. That's kind of my credo. Correct. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, I, have a, uh, I have a question, Chad. Yeah. Uh, when I compare this song to the, the previous two, the Adele song and the one before that, um, I noticed, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, this song has more conversational uh, lyrics in it, whereas the Adele song one before that had more metaphors and um, not as conversational in my opinion, but it still makes sense and you're able to follow and really understand uh, what the singer is feeling and what they're singing about. Uh, can you touch on that? Because I feel like there are some songs that really do a fantastic job in breaking the rule of conversation and go straight for the metaphors to establish um, the setting and, and plot and who, what, when, where, and how, and still make sense and still sound beautiful. Totally. So when I think about, when I think about conversational, I think about words that people would use in everyday language, right? We, we like, when we're talking to friends, we use analogies and we use metaphors sometimes when we're speaking to other people, but we're still using everyday language to deliver that message, right? So we're not using big words. We're not using words that we don't have to. Um, so if we go back here to like time after time, you know, lying in my bed, I hear the clock tick and I think of you. That's very concrete. But then it goes very emotional where it's um, kind of what, what this song is doing. It, it's going like concrete, emotion, concrete, concrete, right? So it, there's there's a little bit more, there's more emotion early, if that makes sense. But she's not really using big words that people wouldn't say, right? I mean, you could probably say this to a friend, like I was lying in bed, I was listening to the clock tick and I was thinking of this person, you know, I was just kind of caught up and I just feel really confused. I was thinking back to the nights that we left behind and it's like, it's like I have this suitcase of memories, right? So it's like, you would still say that conversationally. Um, it would be if you started to use words that someone wouldn't necessarily say, right? this is where your thesaurus can be your worst enemy where like let's say you look up the word i don't know bed you know it's like lying in my place of slumber i hear the clock tick and i reminisce about the you know you know melodious evenings that we spent in the meadow like that's that's what we mean by not being conversational it's more okay. of like are you are you saying stuff that people don't actually say does that make sense? Or that's how I think of it anyway. That makes a lot of sense. So you're not speaking or, or in general, they don't mean a lot of metaphors when they say right. non-conversational. Correct. Because we when we do tell stories to our friends and when we talk about people, you know, it's I can't even think of like any metaphorical examples, but if you were explaining to someone like I keep banging my head on the wall, 
we right. know you're not literally banging your head on the wall, right? That's a metaphor for like being stuck or something like that. Jay. Um, so not to, not to uh, interject or, or monopolize, but from my limited experience working with people, I find a lot of people have issues with whether or not they're allowed to place metaphor in things. And what I try to share with people is not whether or not you do, because like you said, people do that in conversation. But it's the volume, the degree to which it disconnects people from the conversation. And people are like, well, what's that word? Or why is this now drifting into like a dream world? We're not even talking about the same thing anymore. Right. And the mistake that people make is they think that, well, the more poetic and the more like, like you said, dream world, the more dream world I make it, the more people will inject themselves into the song but that's that's actually it does the opposite because people don't want to have to think about songs they want to feel them so it's more like like if i said your love hit me like an avalanche or your love was an avalanche either a simile or a metaphor you're speaking metaphorically but you're saying a lot you're you're saying a lot in a short amount of time so the 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 value of using metaphor is being able to show people something without saying very much. So like within the Adele song, if she says, I've been, you know, washing my hands in a river forever and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm drowning here. She doesn't have to explain what she means by like sort of being stuck. She doesn't have to say it because we already sort of know it based on our sort of, implied knowledge of 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 that scene right so that's the power of metaphor is it it helps you say a situation or show a situation without having to explain every little detail if that makes sense right and that is still considered conversational language yep if she said i've been um Gosh, I don't even know what a, a synonym of like washing would be. I've been laun like I've been laundering my my you know yeah. my I've been laundering my fingers in a tributary, right? Like, <laughs> yes, that means the same thing, <laughs> but nobody would say that, right? Like, do you know what I mean? So it, it that's where conversational comes in. It's it's. It's more about the the types of words that you choose. Uh, Ra, you have your hand raised. Gotcha. Yeah, so like conversational also, for some reason, I, mean, I, was, I was thinking of more like the lyrics uh, as if there are two characters and each of them are like saying something. That would be more dialogue, I guess, right? Like described as a dialogue. Um, like for example, the chain smoker, uh, like the song closer, right? And like the male singer and the female singer. And in this case, it's even like two uh, singers, like uh, kind of like having a conversation the entire song. But also sometimes the singer is referring like a story, like describing uh, what each one is saying. Like like they're, they're just talking about like two characters and they just describe the entire, in the entire lyrics, like what's happening uh, between these two people. Yeah. That was my idea of conversational, but now you're showing the conversational as something else too. Too. Yeah. And so the the Chainsmoker song, um, Closer, the first verse is from one person's perspective, and then the second verse is from another person's perspective. And that actually kind of leads into what we're going to talk about next, which is writing your second verse. So that was a perfect, (laughs) that was almost like we planned it, but we didn't. but that comes into writing the second verse and how do you then expand the song and come up with the second verse so it all goes back to our who when where and what in the first verse so before you can effectively write a second verse i think you have to know what you're establishing in your first verse right so you have to have somewhere new to go and the way that you have somewhere new to go is you advance the time so you can play with past present future and that doesn't mean like distant past you know distant future that could be like five minutes ago right now and then like 10 minutes from now right like 
So past, present, future, you can change the order. You might have the first verse be about the past, the second verse is about the present, and then your third verse and bridge could be about the future and sort of what you want to happen, right? Same thing with the who, you can advance the who, so it could be you, me, or us. So what you're talking about in the Chainsmokers song is they're changing the perspective. So you could have the, maybe the first verse be about your perspective, second verse could be about my, my perspective, and then the third verse or bridge could be about our perspective, right? So that's a way to not say the same thing in every verse. And one thing that a lot of songwriters run into the trap of is they say the exact same thing in every verse, but they say it in a different way and it doesn't advance the story. So one way to advance the story is to think about how do I then advance the who, the when, and the where. So um, those are things to think about. Also, you can think about establishing the situation in the first verse, you could establish the conflict in the second verse, and then how do we resolve this in the bridge or the, the third verse. So it's it's really to trying to not to repeat yourself and basically give the whole story away in the first verse. Um, Thanks. So looking at a song by the Beatles, Eleanor Rigby, this song changes the who and the when and the where in each verse. So in the first verse, it says, Eleanor Rigby picks up rice in the church where a wedding has been. So we know it's after a wedding, we know it's in a church, and it's Eleanor Rigby. She lives in a dream. So right there we have concrete, and then lives in a dream is emotional. So again, it's establishing concrete emotion. She waits at a window wearing the face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? Goes back to emotion. Second verse now changes the who. Father Mackenzie writing the words of a sermon that no one will hear. So that's a different what. No one comes near. Look at him working, darning his socks in the night when there's nobody there. What does he care? So again, it changed the who, the when, and the where. And then the last verse comes back to Eleanor and says, Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name. Nobody came. Father Mackenzie wiping the dirt from his hands as he walks from the grave. No one was saved. So the who, the when, and the where changed in each verse. And it was interesting because it went from Eleanor to Father Mackenzie and then both of them. So it's kind of that same concept of me, you, us. It's her, him, them, if that makes sense. So a lot of these things, um, uh, Susan says in all of her life, her, she never realized until now it could be Eleanor and Father, possibly former lovers who didn't get married. Interesting. Could be. But what's interesting is sometimes when I talk to people, they're like, you know, the Beatles didn't need a songwriting workshop or Dylan doesn't need a songwriting workshop. And it's like, well, yeah, but if you look at their songs, they're still doing these things that we're talking about, right? Like, I didn't invent these concepts. Like, these are things that other people have taught me or other things, you know what I mean? So it's interesting to go back and see that these concepts work over and over and over again. And most listeners don't even know what's happening, but it's fun to be able to control it as a songwriter, for sure. Uh, Adam says it's one of his favorite songs. Uh, melodically, it... Uh, it's off the hook. It's a whole different can of worms. Oh, totally. I mean, this is, it's a great song. Uh, Jay. Uh, I, I do hear a lot of the same statements about people and who would and would not need a workshop. What I would say is in those times, a lot of people didn't have the technology. And also, who's to say what they would have created if they had access to workshops like this? So that they're not kind of finding their own patterns and grooves, but like, oh, this is a common thing. It works for a lot of people. Maybe I'll use it more often. Yep. Well, the thing is, is it, everybody learns from their influences, right? So like the Beatles and Dylan and any artist is influenced by something. They, you know, they were listening to something that taught them how to do it. Like Dylan wasn't born with a acoustic guitar in his hands, right? Like he learned how to play guitar. He learned how to write songs. He, it's just the things that we talk about and the things that we try to learn from 
these other artists is what's happening in the songs. Like the, like Adam says, it's the answers are in the songs. It's not about the songwriter. It's about what is the song doing and how can we use that in our own writing? It's funny though. I get so many messages from the Facebook page and like YouTube of people messaging me, like attacking me because how can you teach art? And it's like, well, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of painters actually know some chemistry about what the paint is doing on the canvas, right? Like, I, it, it, you, you have to know the tools in order to use them correctly. So, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how angry people get um, <laughs> about trying to teach other people songwriting. Uh, Susan says, although if we get too rigid in our patterns, we don't necessarily give into the passion and creativity that a lot of people had in those days. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's true. But I also, you know, a week from today, I'm doing a workshop um, on Dylan. And I think what you'll find is he was probably the first to do some things back in his time, which obviously Dylan was in his prime, you know, whatever it was 50 years ago or whatever. But he was a master of structure. Like his songs followed melodic motif, his songs followed repeating sections. Um, he had great uh, imagery and knew how to follow the imagery up with emotion. Like he was doing all of these things that we learn about. So it's like we we can learn it from the music itself, and um, you know, obviously learning from other songwriters and and things like this is a great way to do it as well. So um, Tom says, actually, how do we know that they didn't have workshops by the way they would have been in the 50s, 60s meeting in pubs, churches? Well, to that point too, like Dylan moved to the East Village, right? Adam, that's right. East Village or where was he? West Village. West. You're hey. close. I'm I in live in the East Village. He was in the West Village. I'm not okay. that cool. <laughs> is the West Village more like Chelsea? No, it's um, just below Chelsea. Okay. It's fancier. Yeah. <laughs> not, not then. It wasn't fancy then. <laughs> but there was, a, there was a community of artists, right? So they were probably sharing like chord progressions or they'd go to each other's, um, you know, gigs and they learn from each other just like, hey, how did, you, how did you do that? Or what chords were you playing there? Like they still learned from each other, which is, which is cool. Um, so I wanted to play you another song that I think is a perfect example of advancing who, when, where, and what. And this is also a great example of how the verses change the meaning of the chorus. So this is a song by Steve Seskin, which for those of you who are not familiar with Steve Seskin, he's somebody that you should... Um, definitely check out because Steve teaches workshops and Steve has had some hit songs and he's very much a songwriter songwriter and he's very much about the story song. Um, so if you're looking to, you know, study great story songs, Steve Seskin is, is a great place to, to look. But this is a song that he wrote called Use Mine and pay attention to how the chorus has the same words but means more every time you hear it. Uh -huh. I know Pierre said beautiful song. Um, do you see how the chorus words meant something different every time you heard it, even though the chorus was saying the exact same words? And like, I've heard, again, I've heard this song so many times and like every time it gets to that bridge, I just, I feel like every single hair on my body, like stand up and like, it's just like, it just it's such a an emotional song and i think that's the thing to remember with a song like this is how you can recolor your chorus just by how you set it up with the verse and what he did was he played with the who the when and the where to make that happen right so that's that's something to think about i i hear a lot of writers that they want to change the words in their chorus you know, and it's like, I just think that's kind of a cop out because if you're having to change the words in your chorus, you're not setting it up correctly with your verses. 
if if you're changing the 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 words it means that something's not not sitting correctly something else needs to be looked at or maybe that's not your chorus then if if you have to change the words in the chorus then that might not be a chorus um i know charity says it's not her taste and that's totally fine too but it's still it's still an example of how the structure can be used in any genre to to do the the same thing um, right, right. That's not a... I just felt like it was way too descriptive. There were no metaphors. You saw the end coming, like from a mile away. There were no surprises. It just was. It was overly sentimental. Just yuck. <laughs> but but you know, I should learn how to express myself. <laughs> but you know, that's that, that, those were my feelings about it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. Like even for me, like I'm actually not a Bob Dylan fan. I actually can't stand most Bob Dylan songs. But I also respect him as an artist. <laughs> I get it. And I, and I see the, I, and Adam, what the fuck, Chad? Yeah, yeah. I don't like Dylan. I just, I don't. Yeah, also, I, like, I, I t I'm totally, I, I, I like, the, I'm totally with you. I, I get it, Chad. He's from <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? He barely claims that. He always says he's from New York. So he's kind of disowned yeah. Minnesota a little bit. Um. But no, it's not about, and I think you can learn a lot actually from studying genres that you don't actually listen to. Like Brian just said in the chat, he said, I learned a lot from rap and syllables and he doesn't like rap, you know? Yeah. It's, yep. That's the other thing too. I hear a lot of people like poo-pooing on certain genres, like, oh, well, all pop music sucks or all dance music sucks or rap sucks. It's like, just because you don't like it doesn't mean that it's a bad form of art, right? And I wish more writers would look at it from the perspective of people being creative and like, just that's the way different people express themselves, you know? So, um, and there's no right or wrong, right? That's the whole idea. Like we're songwriters, we're supposed to be rebels. We're, you know, if you like cheesy pop songs, write cheesy pop songs like I do, it's totally cool. Um, so I don't know, know if you guys know um, about Songwriting Academy. It's a group started by a songwriter in the UK. Um, they have a lot of YouTube videos. They have a lot of um, programs that you can pay for online. I am in no way connected to them. So this, you know, they're not paying me to say this, but I've heard a lot of people that have taken their 555 thing where I think it's like either five bucks for five days or $15 for five days or something, but they have a online course. And then that leads to more expensive retreats. And, you know, they take your firstborn and your arm and your leg and all of that stuff too. But he does have a lot of good information. So I thought this tied in um, really well with what we've been talking about in writing second verses. And he actually has a technique that I've actually started to use when I'm writing my own lyrics and it's helped me a ton to get the syllables and the melody to match up between the verses. So check this out. So yeah, so definitely check out their their site and what they've done. Um, Anthony, you said that you've uh, done this uh, or you completed a year with them in February. That's awesome. Um, Brian says that's hard to do if your lines are different lines longer or shorter. I think that's the point, Brian, is that your verses should match. So you shouldn't, it, it should be the same, it should be the same melody, it should be the same structure with just different, different lyrics, because that's what gives the familiarity and your listener knows where they are and what section that they're in. So um, that's one way to, to help make it match. So speaking of, of rhyme schemes, um, just wanted to kind of go over some examples of you know, the four or six line rhyme schemes. Um, and, uh, you know, like we had mentioned, a lot of songs have the four lines or the six lines. These are common rhyme schemes that you can use. Um, J-Rock, I saw that you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Oh, it was about um, that whole second verse thing. And um, I've written songs which kind of, switch up in the second verse like they they are trying to lead people to um you know like the first verse sets up a problem and the second verse goes into the solution so it's kind of a different like i changed vibe um you know kind of like uh setting up the problem is kind of uh you know 
problematic language. And then the solution is more celebratory language and feel and vibe. So I, I kind of uh, honestly, uh, I don't know if people do this or not, but I was playing around with the dynamics of how a song could evolve as a story. So I don't know if that fits in with that copy the same first well, one thing. Yeah, I think some of this can be genre specific, but I think if you break down songs that you like, the verses are usually pretty similar to each other from a like structure standpoint. So it's the same number of lines, it's the same melodic phrasing, it's the same rhyme scheme because your listener likes that familiarity. If you're changing it up too much, it's a new section. So you like, like you might be considering that to be a verse, but it's not necessarily going to act like it's a verse because it's something different. So it's almost like you're creating like if you had, let's say your A, B, A, B song structure, which would be like A is the verse, B is the chorus, A, B. If you're changing that second verse a lot, you're actually creating a C section because it's not the first one. It's not the second. It's something that's completely new. And like what the video just said is your listener will sometimes get lost because they don't know where they are. They keep getting new information and something new all the time. So they never feel that tension and release um, that you get from the A, B, A, B structure. But one of the things that you can do to create dynamics is even if your lyrics, your lyric structure and your melody is the same, is if you're doing production, your production can change, which can create a different feel and create different energy under the same um, structure, which is what a lot of songs do is they add elements within the production or the um, arrangement underneath of the song to add some of that energy. Uh, Jay, you have your hand raised. Just gonna say, I, I feel like a lot of people, they, they see these things and they feel like, okay, here's the answer. This is how you make a second verse where perhaps we should just pause, try the exercise and say, hey, maybe if I'm stuck on a verse two someday, I can pull this out of the tool chest or hey, maybe let me explore where to go on this other thing that may be more targeted to that approach that I'm aiming for, as opposed to it being a designated rule. I think a lot of times people get stuck in absolute thinking versus having a variance of tools in their tool, tip, tool chest. No, absolutely. So yeah, so there's really, there's really no, um, there's no rules to it. And if it works, great. But I think listeners, are not only listening to our music and a lot of times songwriters fall into the trap of they want to impress other musicians and they want to impress other songwriters so they try to do things that are like out of the ordinary and so like freaking awesome that like but it's like you have to remember who your audience is right so your listener doesn't really give a crap if you're doing something completely off the wall or you're breaking the rules right they don't care all they care about is does this song move me and does it sound professional and a song that's all over the place and has no structure and there's not a lot of repetition it will not sound professional to most listeners because most listeners are listening to songs that have very strong structure so that's why even though you don't have to do this it it is something that your listener is used to it's kind of like a home builder right like you could build a house that walks straight into a bathroom from the front door right like screw the rules like i don't want my front door to go into an entryway i want it to go into a bathroom like everybody does it a certain way but are you going to ever be able to sell this house that goes straight into a bathroom from the front door probably not right so there's a difference between if you're just creating songs for art's sake, you can do whatever you want. But if you want to have any glimpse of, of something that connects with more people, you have to think about structure and you have to think about commercial tendencies. Now, commercial tendencies change. Like people who are writing the same style of song that, that Dylan did 60 years ago, like that's fine. But if you're trying to make that commercial, 
that's not what's happening commercially in today's world, right? There's still an audience for that music, but that's not going to get you signed to a publisher, right? Because that was 50 years ago. We don't want 50 years ago. We want what's happening now. Um, and Adam says, even jazz and classical music do this most of the time. Oh, totally. Like there's so many things that fall into like a genre bucket that people would say like, oh, there's all these rules and I don't want to follow these rules. And it's like, well, fine, but there's still something to be said for what people see as being professional. I think if you want to break the rules, break the rules with the content and what you're saying, not how you're saying it, if that makes sense. Um, so these are some common rhyme schemes. So if you want to take a screenshot or or go through these, these are different options that you see, you know, throughout different songs. Um, some of the other songs that have these rhyme schemes, like Someone Like You by Adele, it's an A-A-B-B-C-C -C rhyme scheme in the verse. Cardigan by Taylor Smith is A-A-B-C-C-B. -C -C Eleanor Rigby was the X-A-A-X-B-B -B rhyme scheme. Um, and Razzie says, in order to break the rules, we must understand the game. Absolutely. You know, um, so rhyme schemes is something that you can definitely find in songs that you like. And I would suggest analyzing songs that you like, and you'll realize pretty quickly that they're not as complicated and they're not breaking as many rules as you, you think they are. So verse and melody. So verses and when you're thinking about melody of verses, melody is very important in your verse, just like it is in the chorus. But the job of melody is different in the verse because the verse is what establishes usually the lowest pitch range in the song. So you're kind of establishing your floor. And it also establishes one or two melodic motifs that then you can either repeat or change. Also, the verse melody contrasts from the chorus and other sections of the song. So you want your verse to sound different than your chorus to make sure that your listener's not getting bored. Also, your melody within your verse probably has shorter notes because you're probably saying more in your verse than you are in your chorus. And that melody is more like how we speak conversationally. So it's usually quicker notes. Um, so it's a little bit more um, reflective of, of a conversation. The verse should be memorable and catchy. And then again, repetition is your friend. People like things that sound familiar and you should try to have your song teach itself to your listener with just one or two listens. So one of the things to think about is you can start with one or two short motifs. You know, each verse should really match melodically or as close as you can melodically to the other verses because then your listener knows that it's a verse. And then you don't have to overcomplicate the motifs either. So the power is really in the repetition more than the complexity of the, the motif itself. Oops. So that is actually the last slide that I had um, prepared today. So that kind of wraps up what I, what I had um, for you guys. Is this helpful for you as you think about, you know, writing verses for your songs? Like, how do you see yourself applying this as you as you go forward? It's just more uh, prompts. Yeah. It's always helpful what you do, Chad. Thank you. Just more yeah. We appreciate it, Chad. We covered so much information in such a uh, little time, and I the the content was definitely helpful for, for me because as you know, we were having those discussions. I'm thinking about the songs that I've written the first verse, and it was just terrified of you know even starting the second verse. <laughs> but now I have you know I think more confidence to. Um, to at least start that second verse and um, use some of those techniques, which are, you know, very, very helpful. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And then um, I think the the key to kind of really getting this in into your mind a little bit more too is is taking songs that you really enjoy by other writers 
and really breaking them down and analyzing them kind of like I do, where it's like write out the lyrics and and like see what are they actually doing? Because I think when you hear it in music that you know and appreciate, it can sort of give you a, a like a starting point to think about your own writing. Because again, you're starting from what influences you, because your style might be influenced a lot by another genre that we didn't cover, or there may be patterns that happen that you're not that you're not actually paying attention to when you listen as a fan. So there's a difference between active listening and passive listening. And when you start to listen actively, you can sometimes hear things more than if you're just listening as a as you know, as a fan. So I actually have a YouTube video that's coming out on Monday that's all about active and passive listening. Um, so you'll have to check out the YouTube channel for that. Um, Adam says what I'm saying. Exactly. Because I think you'll be surprised how you may think a song is more complicated or it's breaking some rule or it's like it's very rebellious. But then when you start to look at it, you know, piece by piece, you're like, oh, it's actually following all of the structure that every other song uses. Right. So I think you'll probably surprise yourself. Um, by listen or analyzing the songs that you like and obviously we all like different things so it all will sink in differently for us as well um jay you have your hand raised i just wanted to say really quickly sometimes when i'm writing verses um i'm either working on invoking or amplifying what the character is experiencing to to push that emotionally and sometimes i don't have it and so i start borrowing from other stories usually motion picture. And so that stated, that person has to convey it in a way that's effective. So I'm not sure if this is the correct, um, uh, what is it, Charity, Charity James, um, who acts. But if it is, I want to say thank you so much for your contributions in storytelling realm, because uh, a lot of your characters really shine through. And it really helps some of us when we're struggling writing in other mediums uh, to really translate and pull and borrow from. So thank you. Yeah, Jay, that's a really good tip, actually. Like one of the things that Steve Seskin had said in a workshop that I took with him is he keeps a notebook where he writes down things that he sees in movies or TV shows that spark emotion in him. So if he feels something, he's like, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to write down that situation because if, if that is delivering an emotion, that might be something good to write about because it, it's something that we all kind of connect with, or there's an emotion to it. And I think dialogue within movies is a great place for title ideas. It's a great place for song ideas. Um, and like you said, Jay, you're trying to figure out why is it delivering emotion? And sometimes you're like, is it actually what they're saying? Or is it the music that's playing behind the characters in the movie, right? Like, it, what is delivering the emotion? Um, Adam? Well, I just wanted to add, um, I, I so appreciate that you brought up passive versus active listening, you know, and we were kind of talking before about you know, the answers are all in the music. Um, just to... Um, Something that has helped me a lot. I know that we're focused on lyrics today, but well, Chad, you know, I really love country. I go right up and down the country charts and I learn all the songs, but for all you instrumentalists there that want to improve your melody writing, if you pick or play out the melodies of the songs and can either hold down the chords or the bass notes, or at least be mindful of what the chords are underneath that is like to me that's like the best melodic education you you can get um you, and you'll start to see patterns immediately especially if you go up and down well country is there's a lot of consistency there pops all over the place yet you, you still do see consistency there pops all over the place stylistically um more but you will see you will see the patterns you know you you, you, re, you repeat a melodic motif over a, a different chord than the previous one and it's a completely different feeling it's as if those like a three note motif is different three notes over the next chord because they have a different relationship to the chord underneath. Um, and that's a great way to get like you were talking about, Chad, about the, the notes being lower in verses. A lot of verses 
have I mean, Hotel California is like a two note melody until they deviate from it. But it's just like he, he just kind of like Don Henley just kind of sings between these two notes and then it kind of expands, but not much. <laughs> you know? But that's an example of tension and release, right? So you're building that tension by those two notes where you're like, it's almost like you get almost subconsciously tired of hearing the same two notes, right? But then all of a sudden they open it up and it's like, ah, there's that release. And that's what creates that journey for your listener is, and that happens melodically, it happens lyrically, it happens harmonically. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in other workshops and something that you see a lot is the melodic motif pattern a lot of times follows the rhyme pattern. Lines that rhyme have the same melody. So you're not only creating rhyme lyrically, you're also creating rhyme melodically as well. And you see that a ton in like Max Martin songs. I also see it a lot in newer country songs. Um, even the song um, Fire and Rain that we've talked about by James Taylor, the rhyme scheme matches the melodic motif pattern, which is interesting. Um, Pierre. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to reiterate something you, you just alluded to a couple uh, conversations ago about watching for emotion. You, the tip that you gave, uh, I guess, a couple workshops ago or the last one about watching with the closed caption. Oh, my gosh. I've been doing that for the past while. And, I, and this is not active listening, but it's active watching as well, because I see the words. I go, wait, pause. And the, it's a treasure trove of ideas. Oh, my gosh. Like the dialogue that these writers use, it's, you know, it's just... Like I've got, I'm getting, I'm starting a notebook just of watching uh, movies or TV shows with the closed captions on. Thank you very much for that fantastic tip because it's like I say, I, it's taking me to another level now of just ideas for titles and lyrics and everything else. So thank you. Awesome. For those of you who weren't on whatever workshop that was, I know Pierre, you're almost at every workshop, so that's awesome. Um, uh, we, I was talking about one of the ways that I watch for lyric ideas and title ideas is I watch TV with closed captioning on because reading the dialogue, it, it's for some reason, it's different than when you're just listening to it. I don't know if you're just listening to it, it goes by so fast that it doesn't register as lyrics, but when you are reading it, it just makes it seem more like it's more lyrical. And I don't know, Pierre, is that what you've experienced as well? Totally, totally. Yeah. And especially in certain, you know, real good movies there, it's just like, oh my gosh, it's like, I could take exactly what they said, put it directly into song lyrics. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. yep. Another um, tip that, um, that, that I use is uh, if you're a lover of art and specifically paintings, um, I would, you know, look at a painting and um, just kind of feel whatever emotion that is evoking inside of me. And sometimes I would, you know, I can see the image and I can write about that and write a song about it um, or make up a story about it or try to envision, okay, what are these people doing in this painting? What is, what is the journey that they're going through and what might possibly be their life experience and write about that in a song? Because you have the image in front of you, you don't have to really make it up. Uh, it's just about expressing what is already on paint and filling in the rest. That's an awesome tip, tip for sure. Yeah, that's almost, that's a good um, free writing exercise where like you could take a painting or something and just, what are you feeling? What are you seeing? Like write all of that stuff down and then does that become a song? Or you can go the other way too. Like let's say Pierre sees a line in a movie, go to Google images and type in that line and see what images pop up and then you can write from what you're seeing like you said you're not having to create it from nothing then you're actually just it's almost like you're dictating or you're just capturing something that's already there yeah that's great advice any other quick like songwriting tips that you guys do that other people might find helpful this is a great conversation for sure but I think what she said is basically just kind of if you're in a certain moment or a certain situation, write down what you're experiencing and putting that in into a song. Right. So like if you're at some event, um, you know, it like it is kind of like journaling, but it's more like you're capturing what's going on. I think that's I think that's what I heard. Um, Mainly that like be still with yourself at a space where you feel like this could be good. 
with yourself and just like hear every single emotion you feel like and if you don't know what it is start asking yourself like like, like you're self-inspired you know what does that mean and then just, it. just write it down it's quite it. but okay cool it might be surprised with yourself yeah. So, so what she was saying is kind of being with yourself and being still and then whatever kind of comes to mind. So it's really more like a self-inflection, um, emotional thing. Definitely. Uh, J-Rock, you had your hand raised as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, I like what Ray Ra was saying because that's kind of how I write and I just write ideas down constantly. But um, I guess this might be a whole other session or something, but uh, I'm trying to figure out how to go from writing, because we talked about, you know, in that video, they were talking about coming up with melodies and kind of like uh, make it up a melody and then coming up with the lyrics, but going the other way where you have lyrics or poetry written out, you know, how do you put that to musical ideas? Um, so, I mean, I'm kind of playing around with it, just like, uh, you know, uh, trying to come up with melodies to the words. Yeah, well, so melody, and we have done other workshops on melody and sort of melodic tools and things as well, but melody is built on two things. It's built on rhythm and pitch. And half of that comes from the lyric as well. So your your lyrics have definitely a rhythm, right? So the way that you sing or recite those lyrics to a beat or a, or a metronome gives you the rhythm of the melody, which you could then later put pitches to, right? So then you're, you're only really deciding on the pitch values rather than um, the rhythm, because your mel your lyric does hold rhythm. But the way that you recite them or the type of emotion that you speak with also is melodic, right? So even the way that I'm speaking is when I went also is melodic, it goes da 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 da. So like we speak in melody, because if we didn't, we'd be robotic, it would be like we talk on one note and nothing ever changes ever. This is the way that it would be. But we go up and then we go down and then we go up. So like, the emotion is also captured into it's captured in the way that we speak and there's different intervals that align with the way that we hear things right so just reciting your lyric over and over again can sometimes give you a pattern that can become a melody so a lot of times recite your lyrics as if you're an actor and then record that and then listen to it back and see if there's actually melodic patterns that make sense that that live in there too if that makes sense adam is smiling so that must have been a, a good answer huh yeah you you said like my entire life's work like verbatim <laughs> <laughs> when i made that discovery about the rhythm of melody and and i i also actually um i'd love to share that i just watched this um interview with tom shapiro hall of fame nashville songwriter and he was saying how he doesn't um, he's all about the phrasing and the rhythm of the words and the cadence. And if the notes come out in the moment, great. If not, he goes back to him later. And I'm like, oh, great. I've been doing it that way for a long time. <laughs> yeah, there's other songwriters, too, that you'll see in different um, interview interviews where they kind of they never use him by name, but they they kind of make fun of him a little bit that pitch wise Sh Shapiro's melodies when he first writes them are awful but it's, <laughs> i just never the, heard that that's funny but it's well they never say it's him but like it kind of points to him right but it's all about how the rhythm how it sits rhythmically and how he just gives a general sort of pitch idea of how the song goes but yet he still captures a ton of emotion in the rhythm and how the lyric is is delivered so yeah Phrasing, it's so the rhythm of the melody is 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 the top of the if there really has to be a thing i'm actually when, when whenever we're done i have to like i'm helping a friend of a collaborator of mine we're, we're working on the phrasing like meticulously of two songs that we're uh submitting for a show um but yeah it's exact that's exactly what we're doing we're making sure every single word every single syllable every single accent is like perfect 
So yeah. don't be a perfectionist, folks, though. It's painful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Charity, you had your hand raised as well. Oh yeah, I was just gonna put it in the chat. Uh, I was gonna say that uh, what a great tip because you know I, when I write, um, it always just happens for me that that the um, that the lyric and the melody kind of come at the same time. Um, so the the prosody just kind of happens. But what a great tip if it's just not happening. You just what, what, what my um, what my um, method seems to be lately is to just sit down and get the inspiration you know, on guitar or piano or keyboards. But then what happens is my critic comes in really fast. So what I do is to try to keep the critic at bay is to um, uh, record with my, you know, with my iPhone, my initial inspiration. And if, I, and if I, if, if the critic starts coming in, what I do is I just stop. I go to the computer or a pad, but for me, it's a computer. And I write what I have so far, I just dictate what's come off of the, what I just did, what, what I get off of the recording. And once I actually have some of the lyric there, then my other part of my brain just starts to write lyrics. It's just like all of a sudden when it's really on paper, the lyrics start coming if I'm really stuck. And it's it's just kind of like switching switching gears in the middle of the writing process to kind of, kind of jump, trick your brain or jumpstart your brain in a weird way that you can just kind of, you go back and forth, and then that way I find, um, so far, it's it's kind of uh, working. Totally. And I think that's, and that's the beauty about kind of writing songs is, is you do, if you know different options that you have, you can sort of know when to try different things or like, it's like, hey, I kind of have something going here, like melodically, so I'm just going to record that so I capture it. Because you will not remember it no matter how good you think it is you no. will not remember it ever no way because i've lied to myself <laughs> so many times about that because i'm like oh that i don't need to write that down it's i'll so remember strong. that <laughs> nope nope it's gone um but no that's that's exactly it is sometimes you do have to sort of use the other side of your brain whether that's the logical side or if that's more of the emotional creative side and a lot of times recording something and then you know, even writing down dummy lyrics, like if you sort of know the way that it goes, but you don't necessarily know what the final lyric is, don't be afraid to write just gibberish or stuff that doesn't make any sense, you know. Um, Lewis, you had your hand raised. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. I have a question. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, when uh, you mentioned writing music, you did mention about having a premise. Does most of your songwriting need to have a premise like does it have to be a concrete premise because like sometimes i'm noticing i'm not a, i'm mostly a musician but if i'm trying to songwrite my premises seem really vague or like tend to wax philosophical so i have a hard time i guess just organizing my thoughts or trying to i guess put it more concretely do you have any tips or suggestions for that um i think it you know the the big answer, I think the philosophical answer about songwriting is that the song should deliver an emotional experience for the listener, right? So does a song have to make complete sense and make a complete point? It doesn't necessarily have to if it elicits an emotional response from the listener. So there are certain genres that the emotion is delivered more musically than it is lyrically, right? So if you listen to um, a lot of electronic music, there may be one or two lines of lyric that say something that could be very philosophical, but yet the emotion is captured in the tension and the release of the music. So there's that part of it. Um, Lewis, what genre, are you writing in a certain genre or what's kind of, what's your, what's your style that you're writing in mostly? I'm, I'd say I'm toying with a couple of genres. Um, so one of them was just mostly like industrial um, metal music and the other was like 80s synth wave. <laughs> and I know that for like most synth wave, they try to keep it to generic uh, 80s lyrics. Uh, so that's been interesting, but I didn't want it to sound like that generic. I want it to sound like a bit more philosophical. So uh, that's kind of my dilemma there. I think 
I know what you're saying because I've listened to synthwave music that has, you know, like some of some of the synthwave stuff doesn't actually have any lyrics. Like it builds yeah. kind of through through music and and instrumental. Um, I think from you as the writer or how I would approach it is even if you're being philosophical, it still probably wouldn't hurt to come up with some kind of point that you're trying to deliver, right? Like you should probably come up with what is this philosophical idea that I'm, I'm trying to get across. And sometimes that philosophical idea may actually just be an emotion, right? That might be like, I want this song to be about anxiety, or I want this song to be about elation. Mm -hmm. And then what are words then that sort of orbit that concept, right? Because sometimes if you're doing a more abstract style, like a synth wave, um, which I'm assuming, you know, there's probably effects on the vocal. There's probably like a lot of like delays, or there might be even like vocoder stuff going on. Like mm -hmm. you could then use little phrases that still deliver that idea. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't think you go wrong by being more specific, I guess is what I'm saying is the more specific that you can pull it, the more chance you have of being able to consciously deliver a message that you want to deliver. Otherwise, you're just kind of doing it by chance, right? And that's totally cool if that's okay with you, right? So if you're just doing whatever comes to mind and then whatever the listener experiences, that's totally fine. But I think a lot of times we as songwriters are looking to um, have the mastery of the craft in order to deliver something that we want to deliver. I hope that hope that makes sense. It does, yeah. Cool. Um, question: I, you had mentioned that this was being recorded or was being recorded. Do you yeah. know where we can find that? All right, the link uh, of the recorded session for this. So I will, um, within the next week or so, I'll get it put onto our YouTube channel, and then I usually send out the Zoom link um, to everybody that attends as well. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much for answering my question. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Jay. Um, it's just really on, on what Lewis was saying. I don't want to speculate. Maybe I misunderstood. But when you said that you're a musician mostly, I'm interpreting that as an instrumentator, someone who uses just instruments and don't know how to really place your, yourself in words. If I'm understanding that correctly, perhaps instead of trying to jump directly into words, using your mouth simply to sound out melodic phrases and patterns syllabically, just kind of like mumble rap. Da, 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 da. That way you at least have that pattern to pitch to or are able to find something so that when people you may work with uh, who could place words for you, or maybe you circle back and find words later, you will at least have something that's etched in the moment uh, for you to map to. Yeah, that's a good, that's good advice too. So really you're, you're starting with melody and then go back later and put lyrics to kind of the mumble, mumble singing. Awesome, Jay. Uh, Jay Rock. Hey, yeah. So I was going to talk about that too. Like on the one hand, I would preface it by saying that I have heard music where there's philosophical ramblings and over a beat and if it, in the right environment. <laughs> It can be fun to listen to, you know, in the right situation. I was quite impressed by this person's, you know, um, freewheeling, like uh, free thought type of lyrics. He's just talking about his day and what he's thinking about rhyming it. You know, it's it, he's freestyle in it, but it was sounding pretty cool. So on that side, um, I it can work. It can work. But on the other side is that, you know, I would just say, um, you know, on a like the philosophical side, like it's about self exploration. So the song could be about how you came to a realization. Like instead of writing out the free verse, freestyle, thinking out loud type of thing, you come up with a realization and then you go back and show how you came up with that realization or show that epiphany. Um, or even, you know, when you're at, uh, exploring a question 
and you want the audience to explore it with you, you know, you're doing it by uh, a story rather than just the words. So I guess in a nutshell, I'm saying show instead of say. Yeah. Show, show instead of tell is what we, you know, instead of showing and telling. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome advice. Actually. Like you're saying here's like, here's what I came to realize. And then you explaining like how I came to real, that's a, that's an awesome, that's an awesome technique, even if it's not philosophical, right? Like looking at how we got somewhere is a great place to get verse information as well. You know, what, what led to the emotion that we're writing about. You know, how did we get here? That's really good, really good advice. Awesome, so the next um, workshop that I'm doing is coming up on Tuesday night and probably will be a shorter workshop. I just wanna show you some, t some techniques on how to find the different rhyme types. So you're not using the same rhymes over and over again. Um, and also some techniques that I use to come up with um, more, still conversational, but out of the ordinary rhymes. I love it when my songs get the feedback that it's like you're rhyming, but it doesn't sound like you're forcing it, right? So I'll teach you some ways that you can um, do that. And then also show you how you, you how you can find more than just perfect rhyme. Because if you're only using perfect rhyme, you're missing out on a whole spectrum and a whole palette of of words that you can use. So that's Tuesday night. And then next Saturday, we'll be doing the Bob Dylan um, workshop, which I think will be fun as well. Um, I do have to preface that Bob Dylan has such a huge catalog that if you're expecting to go really deep, we won't have the time to go really deep. But I think what we will cover will show you why some of the most popular Bob Dylan songs are his most popular. Um, and I think you'll also see that he was a master of marrying lyric to melody. So I think um, even if you're not a Dylan fan, like I said, I'm not a huge Dylan fan. I don't know why, but I know a lot of people are, but I still respect him and the influence that he's had. And I think um, it will be a good good workshop to even just see how what he was doing actually isn't that different than what's hap happening in music today. So hopefully you can join us for that as well. But Thanks again, everybody, for for joining. Hopefully, it's helpful. Um, I'd love to hear how these things are are helping you write the songs, and hopefully, it's making you excited to go out and actually write more songs. So, I appreciate you guys, and I will see you next time. Thank you, Chad. It was Thanks, awesome. Chad. Always. Chad, thank you, everybody.